This is Andy. Welcome back to another episode of the Sprinkler Nerd Show. Today we're going to be discussing flow sensing technologies with Norm Bartlett. Norm is the founder and president of Creative Sensor Technology, a company that he founded in the early 2000s after finishing a long career with Data Industrial, one of the early pioneers of flow sensing technology. Norm is an industry expert, he's very well connected, and he has been working in the landscape and irrigation industry since the 1960s. He's got a lot to share, and I will say that the audio starts out a little bit fuzzy, so just be patient. I'm hoping that we can edit this to provide additional clarity, but it may be a little bit rough, so hang in there. I apologize and hope the next episode is clearer. So without further ado, let's jump right in to our discussion with Norm. If you are an irrigation professional, old or new, who designs, installs, or maintains high-end residential, commercial, or municipal properties, and you want to use technology to improve your business, to get a leg up on your competition, even if you're an old-school irrigator from the days of hydraulic systems, this show is for you. Norm, welcome to the Sprinkler Nerd Show. So glad to have you with us today. Well, Andy, thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and you have, I would say, one of the deepest backgrounds in flow sensing technology as well as this industry and sort of all of the players involved with this industry from the specification to distribution to contractors as well as the change that we've seen historically and kind of where we're going with flow sensing technology. And so why don't we just start with who you are, where you live, what you do, and a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, obviously I'm Norm Bartlett and I'm the president of Creative Sensor Technology. Currently, and and kind of a short-term resident of a little town called Lincoln, New Hampshire, up in the White Mountains. I look out of the front door at the backside of one of the local ski areas. So we moved from almost on Cape Cod in southern Massachusetts up here last fall and going to give it a try and see how we like it. Awesome. I don't know that I knew that. I spent my high school years at a small school called Holderness School, which is not far from Lincoln. No, you're not. Go by that exit all the time and uh, actually stop and get gas at the uh, Irving Station right there, almost <laughs> immediately below the Holderness campus. Yeah, absolutely. That was back before I could even drive and I'd have to go get my snacks down at the Irving gas station. So how funny is that? So I'm guessing you're near Loon Mountain. Is that right? We are. We're about two miles from the bridge going into Loon Mountain. Awesome. Well, keep going. Sorry to interrupt you there. No problem. Give you a little bit of the background or how I get into this silly position I'm in. I guess I get into it and somebody said, have you spent your whole life in the irrigation business? And I say, not yet. But I... Uh, <laughs> I grew up in a little town right outside of Boston and actually lived across the street from a little nine-hole golf course. My dad was a golfer. He was a greens chairman. And, you know, at 14 years old, when they were looking for somebody to drag hoses onto the greens and things, I was elected. So I started irrigating, as you would say, a long time ago. From there, I got kind of fascinated, you know, with the golf course and probably with the mechanical aspects of things. I, my older brother and I were always the kind of guys that liked to putter with cars and engines and boats and lawnmowers and anything that had mechanical parts to it. We took apart to see how they worked and just kind of fell into motors and pumps and sprinklers and everything else. I actually... As I get older and get out of high school, I decided I'd enroll in the Stockbridge School of Agriculture up at UMass and pursue a career as a golf course superintendent and work, you know, summers and weekends and things like that on larger golf courses. But by the Mm -hmm. time I finished that associate's program, I realized I really wanted to get a a four-year education. So I transferred into UMass and got a bachelor of science degree in plant and soil science. Awesome. And that's particularly useful in this industry. Absolutely. And I had no idea, you know, how connected I'd be to it. I graduated and applied for a job and wanted to see some of the country. So I actually went out to the West Coast and my first employment was with Buckner Sprinkler Company in Fresno. And I got into a role as kind of the go-to technical guy and the uh, guy that would travel out and take care of problems in the field. Yeah. And Buckner is a great company and especially has a great reputation and history. 
Well, and uh, I hate to admit it, but this was back in the late 60s. So then I came I came back from there because I really, rather than do that, wanted to get back to the East Coast and actually get into the contracting and distribution business. Back in those days, probably uh, everybody that was in the distribution business had some kind of a contracting arm of their company, and we fell into that. I guess probably through all of the 70s and pretty much uh, into the mid 80s, I was working for either an irrigation contractor or starting a contracting company or doing something like that where I was actually putting product in the ground. Awesome. You can speak from experience. Like they say, I know where all the bodies are buried. So, you know, <laughs> we went from there to uh, I finally, mid 80s or so, decided I really had had enough of the irrigation business and I'd try something different. So I, on a lark, applied for a job with a uh, company on Cape Cod that made marine instruments for pleasure boats. And I got the job with them. And as soon as I thought I had escaped, they said, you know, we really are looking for somebody to sell our industrial product line. We're going to make a flow sensor under the name of Data Industrial. So I said, well, a job's a job and it's a steady paycheck. So I'll try that. And as soon as I got familiar with the product line, I realized, boy, this is a perfect fit for the irrigation business. So I... Mm -hmm. I went out and started trying to call on irrigation folks back around 1985 is my start in that career. And I uh, can say I probably infiltrated the irrigation market with data industrial flow sensors starting back then. Absolutely. I mean, data industrial is the sort of quintessential flow sensing product or was, let's not say is necessarily today, but certainly was the staple product. You did a good job. Yeah, I did. Almost too good a job because I've gone back to some folks and tried to sell them CST stuff and they're still stuck on the old brands. But you know, <laughs> I can't blame them for that. But anyway, I did that and actually worked my way up from regional sales to sales manager to VP of sales. And then in the early 90s, became one of the owners when we bought the division away from Data Marine, which was the parent company. And I continued to work for them until we decided to sell it in the early 2000s. So I was with them until 2004, just shy of 20 years and gained a wealth of experience, usually probably the hard way, but learned an awful lot about flow measurement. Yeah. So then uh, after that, I had a little brief career as a sales rep and I repped a couple of different product lines. And while I was doing that, I had always been a member of the American Society of Irrigation Consultants. And so I was at one of their conferences in Newport Beach in 2000. Four, I believe, and they approached me and asked if my wife and I would take on the duties as executive director. So I don't know, for better or for worse, we said, yes, we would. And so we then managed the organization and ran the home office, if you will, for them and put on conferences. And uh, they had some very nice conferences and a, and a great bunch of people there. And obviously spent a lot more time with irrigation consultants and landscape architects and designers and also all of the manufacturers that exhibited with them and were members of the organization like I was as associate members. Mm -hmm. So while I was doing that, I got to get the itch to go back into the flow sensor business in 2007 i decided that we'd start a company called creative sensor technology and actually i had three of the engineers that worked for me at data industrial were still living on cape cod and, and in the local area to where i lived and we i guess put the band back together and decided we'd make new flow sensors uh, and started from scratch so we took all of the knowledge good and bad that we had working for data industrial and clean sheet of paper and said we'd design a new flow sensor completely from scratch, trying to improve on everything that we had sold before. Of course, it took, I would say, two years or more to get to a product to market because of the development time involved. And we started selling sensors in 2009, I think. If you remember, that was right after the big I downturn do. in the market in 2008. So I have a pension for timing of things like this. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember when you came out with the sensors in 2009, right. and we kind of created that partnership at Baseline, and um, for sure, I remember it well. Yeah, no, we, I think Baseline was our first privately branded sensor and a collaborative effort because, in your case, we put the decoder circuitry into the same housing as our sensor circuitry, basically all on one circuit board, and came up with a great little product. Mm-hmm. 
So CSD began to grow a little bit, and by 2012, I decided that we could no longer wear two hats, and I decided it was time to resign from uh, ASIC and devote my full-time attention to CST. And so, you know, from then on, we've just continued to grow and we've continued to make flow sensors and we've got a couple of patents along the way, one on our pathway device that allows us to add flow sensors using the existing wire that's in the ground. And then the other one is on this new ELF product that we've just come out with. So... Awesome. We're still rolling along. And as one of my grandkids said, you know, I think CST doesn't stand for creative sensor technology. I think it stands for can't stop trying. <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, but that's like a really good compliment, I think. No, it is. So we can't we, you stop know, trying. I mean, yeah, it's great. Yeah. We've had fun doing it and it's still going strong. And, you know, we're looking forward to some nice growth this year with the beginnings of this ELF sensor hitting the market. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so we're going to get into some flow sensing, some technical details, but there's a couple places I wanted to start. One is the observation that flow sensing 10 years ago was only possible with the most expensive and most complex irrigation systems. It was not something the everyday controller was capable of. And as time has moved on, it is now becoming something that perhaps within five years, everyday controllers will or could have the ability to add flow sensing capabilities. So I want to just kind of mention that as an observation for those that are listening, that flow sensing historically wasn't something everybody got involved with. And as time moves ahead, it will be something that everybody gets involved with. So that's my sort of first comment. And then the first question I have for you that I hear a lot is, what is the difference between a flow sensor and a flow meter? Okay. You know, in the irrigation business, Andy, they're almost synonymous. They're used interchangeably. When we first started selling data industrial flow meters, we had so many people in the industry refer to them as sensors, sensors. You know, I want to get some sensors from you that it just kind of adopted the name flow sensor. So in terms of what we see now, they're pretty much used interchangeably. If you go to industry, they really kind of make the distinction very simply. They look at it as a flow meter is a device that has a register or a display on it. You know, it not only is the element that measures the flow, but it also either totalizes or displays flow. And that would be in a mechanical fashion or a digital fashion or both? It could be both. And it could be, you know, there's a myriad of different kinds of ways to detect flow. And a flow sensor can be various kinds of mechanical or electronic ways of measuring flow movement and then processing it into a signal and crunching the numbers and coming up with a display of either rate or total. And that's kind of what a meter is. A flow sensor in industrial terms is more of a transducer. It could be, you know, the same thing as a pressure sensor, a temperature sensor, a moisture sensor, in that it's a device that makes the measurement and rather than display it, it transmits it over wires or wirelessly or however it is, but it basically transmits the information to another device that actually does the recording or display. And a flow sensor then would work with a, a flow monitor or some kind of control device, such as an irrigation controller. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. But in practical terms, they're used interchangeably almost. Okay. So just to restate, a flow meter has a register, could be an analog or a digital register that records and displays the water usage on the device. And a flow sensor is more like a transducer type device that records and sends the information back to a controller or a device somewhere else. That's correct. And a flow meter may have a display. It may or may not also have a transmitter capability. So you can use a water meter, if you will, as a water sensor, a flow sensor. Got it. Great. So let's talk about your flow sensors. Tell us a little bit about your product line and where the current use cases are for it. Well, when we started creative sensor technology, we said we're going to concentrate on the irrigation business. And looking at the irrigation business, we weren't 
thinking that we could go into the agricultural markets because of the size of the devices. We said we're going to try and pick out a sweet spot and go with the residential, commercial, athletic field, sports complex kinds of applications, you know, basically landscape irrigation. And of course, doing that, as you said, when we started even in 2007, you know, we're looking at light commercial, homeowner associations, school campuses, industrial parks, things like that. Probably not the residential market because there weren't any residential controllers at that point. So we're in the inch and a half, two inch size range. And those were the first products we came out with. But we came out with sensors that would also measure lots lower flows than what was on the market currently. Uh, And we tried to make them as easy to service as possible and you know, see if we could get the most bang for the buck out of it that we could with limited sizes. And then since that time, we've added additional sizes every year. We came out with a one-inch sensor that would go down below a gallon per minute, which is an advance for the time. Then we came out with some saddle-type sensors in three and four and eventually six-inch sizes so we could get to the athletic fields, the larger industrial parks, and the larger applications that way, but always trying to do it with the same technology. My experience in the flow meter business has been, you know, to look at it, there's a lot of different technologies that can be used, but we think the ideal one for the irrigation business is a paddle wheel, the impeller type sensor, because it's easy to clean, it's easy to troubleshoot, it doesn't foul, and it's pretty cost effective for the kind of product that it is. It fits the marketplace. So mm-hmm. now that as we've seen the evolution, like uh, you mentioned earlier, of people looking at smaller and smaller controllers coming out with the capabilities of measuring flow, and it really is now we're kind of right on the doorstep of seeing residential controllers, the you know the Hunter Hydrowise units, the Rainbird mm-hmm. uh, ESP ME3s. They're certainly not trying to only mention those two. There are plenty of others coming out with a residential size controller that would fit that price range that will also be capable of measuring flow and uh, recording flow and, and acting on it. And of course, you know, what we look at with a flow sensor is that why put in a flow sensor? Because whether we like it or not, we've got to be in the business of conserving water and managing our water use. And, you know, I can't see any other way to manage something unless you measure it. So having the ability to measure in real time the water that's being used by a zone, by a sprinkler head, by a system gives you the ability to manage it better and to see if there are things that are going wrong with it. Of course, mm-hmm. the other thing that probably the best water conservation tool you can have is a flow sensor that detects leaks and can shut off mm-hmm. a valve or, you know, people run over sprinkler heads. People break heads, they break risers and things like that. And if they go undetected, we're wasting a lot more water that way than we ever can recoup with high efficiency nozzles or low flow sprinkler heads. Yes. Yep. And if you don't measure it, you don't know how much you can conserve unless you know how much you're using. Right. From a water management standpoint, it's a tool. And from a water control and protection standpoint, a flow sensor and a master valve to me is almost essential these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that sometimes, if not most of the time, we don't realize how much water we're using. We think of our systems in terms of you know, gallons per minute and more so just run time. So we look at zones and we say, this zone has a 12 minute run time or this zone has a 40 minute run time. And us as professional irrigators will understand what gallons per minute means and how much water in theory that that is. But when we speak to someone that's either the consumer on the residential side or the client on the commercial side, we ask them, do you know how much water your sprinkler system uses per night? They may only say a couple thousand gallons. They may not think 20,000 gallons that sometimes when you quantify it, you get deer in the headlights. Right. You're kidding me. That much water? Exactly. And people don't understand that they say, well, you know, in my climate, I need to apply an inch of water per week. And an inch of water per week over an an acre of area is almost 30,000 gallons. Right. So you multiply that out by a a six-month watering season, and you're talking about some real consumption of water. Yeah. So let's go back into your different flow sensor types. Can you walk us through the smallest or can you just kind of walk us through your line? 
Sure. Well, like I said, the first ones that we came out with was a, a series that we called FSI. They're all PVC T-type sensors. They uh, are in inch, inch and a half, and two inch sizes. Basically, they all have the same insert, which is the brains of the outfit. It's the device that contains the circuitry and the impeller turns in the flow. And as it turns, it generates a signal that's picked up by circuitry in the insert, and that circuitry conditions it and puts out a digital pulse. And when we made these, we said, well, trying to keep a number of different units to a minimum, we'll try and use this same insert in all of our flow sensor sizes. So all those three sizes have the same insert in them. It's just a matter of setting it up with the controller with the appropriate programming constants that changes the ability to be a one inch or a two inch sensor. Okay. Is that what was referred to as a K factor and offset? Yes. Those are merely okay. the constants, if you will, that are entered into the irrigation controller's programming firmware, if you will. And that's what determines how it interprets the frequency coming out of the sensor. Got it. When we went to the saddle type sensors, the three, four and six inch ones, we were able to use the same insert. So we basically could cover everything from one gallon a minute up to about 1100 gallons a minute using the same insert. We also looked at it and said, well, the two things we want to do is make it easily serviceable. So we put a jar top kind of retaining nut on the top of it rather than bolt it into the mounting tee any other way so that it could be easily taken in and out of a tee that's in a valve box underground. And that's mm-hmm. worked out very well for us. And then recently, the end of 2018, we finished developing this new ELF sensor or ELF meter, as we call it. And basically the ELF stands for enhanced low flow. Because again, a lot of our specifiers were saying, you know, we're going more and more to drip type systems. We're getting into incredibly low flow and we need a flow sensor that can measure below three quarters of a gallon per minute. We need something that'll go down to half a gallon or maybe even a quarter of a gallon. Gotcha. Let's talk about that for a second. What is it about sensors of the past that either made them not able to read it or less efficient? Well, I mean, basically what it is, is any meter, nothing measures down to zero. Anything that has moving parts, anything that has a magnetic field or sheds vortices or does anything else has a bottom end where there just isn't enough energy in the water to be, in practical terms, be able to be read. So what we looked at when we developed these sensors is we said, if we make a really efficient impeller that's very, very small and lightweight, and then we put that in a very well-designed flow channel through the mounting hardware, you know, we probably can get more efficient out of it and get to lower flows. So when we develop this, uh, the impeller itself is our design. All of the parts that we use are molded. They're our designs, our tools, so that we can create a very smooth path through the sensor. And with a very lightweight impeller with a very good bearing on it, it means it takes very little energy in the water to turn that impeller around. It also means that it's a very simple thing to kind of get your head around and understand that if the impeller isn't turning, it's not producing a signal, and it's easy to troubleshoot. If you take the impeller, that little insert out of the pipe and spin it by hand, you know that it's working. If it had to be cleaned a little bit because it's got sand or silt or aquatic weeds wrapped around it, you know, you can quickly tell that. Some of the devices that have been used in this application, you know, they have no provision to clean them out or to take a peek at them and look at them and and try and troubleshoot means taking the whole device out of the ground. And if it's a couple of the electronic types of sensors, there really is nothing you can do to simulate flow. Got it. Okay. So we got stuck on this idea. And, you know, when we did our testing, we were very happy with the results because they came out, you know, really at our expectations, you know, to get a flow sensor, like a two inch flow sensor that would measure a gallon and a half per minute or two gallons a minute was pretty much unheard of up until the time that we brought this out. We can pick up these low flows. But the other thing about our type of device is that it has a tremendous range. We can run much faster velocity through a flow sensor than people would normally design pipe. Now, what does that mean specifically? I think I know because I can catch what you're putting out, but say a little bit more about that, a higher velocity. What does that mean? 
Well, what we're doing with a mechanical flow sensor is we're really not measuring flow directly. What we're measuring is the velocity of the fluid moving through the measuring chamber. So the faster it goes, what we do is it spins the impeller faster and faster, and we get a higher frequency signal. So this velocity changes constant velocity through a one-inch sensor is, you know, one gallon per minute flow rate. The same velocity through a two-inch sensor would be approximately four times the flow rate. We looked at it, too, and we said, all right, we can spin our little impeller pretty much up to anything that we want. And because it's a little tiny impeller and we have a nice smooth path through our device, there's virtually no friction loss to it. There's a slight bit of pressure drop just basically because of the size of the passage through the T. But we can easily run a flow sensor, an impeller flow sensor, and probably one of the highest selling points of impeller type technology is you can run them at 15 or 20 feet per second and basically have the same velocity going through it. It creates no more pressure drop than if it was smooth pipe. Okay. And in fact, during years, we did some testing with a fire truck company out in Wisconsin, Pierce Fire Trucks, and we actually ran water through a flow sensor at 60 feet per second. Unbelievable. And for those that are listening that may or may not know, what's recommended for most piping systems in the irrigation industry is five feet per second. Is that correct? Correct. That's the rule of thumb for irrigation. Mm -hmm. You know, people know what five feet per second is. It's about 50 gallons a minute in a two-inch line, you know, perhaps more like 15 or 16 gallons per minute in a one-inch line. So we realized that you could take that kind of velocity and you can measure it with a flow sensor and an impeller type sensor. You could go two or even three times that much without hurting the sensor. And it would do one thing in particular for you is it would give you much better range at the low end of the flow. So if you have a lightweight impeller in a device like this, it means that it can be much more sensitive at low flow without sacrificing anything on the high end. So You know, we have the ability to measure 40, 50, you know, a range of 60 to 1 is not unheard of in an impeller flow meter. That means that the the maximum might be 60 times what that minimum is. In our new ELF, the minimum flow that we can measure to the maximum is a ratio of 100 to 1. Our little ELF sensor that we made to be, you know, super low detection at 0.2 gallons per minute will go all the way up to 20 gallons a minute. Yeah, 20 gallons a minute, it's still only, uh, you might have a pound or two of of friction loss. And that's going to cover almost 100% of residential systems. Certainly 85% of residential systems will be 0.2 to 20 gallons per minute. Right. And then our traditional one-inch sensor will go from, say, 0.8 up to 50. So that would cover a a variety of residential, light commercial, you know, small, uh, you know, HOA type of systems. Yeah. So when you're talking about velocity, I just want to step back for a second. Where does straight pipe fit into this? Because there's always been this sort of 10 and five times the pipe diameter of straight pipe before and after the meter. You know, that's kind of the standard minimum. And all we're trying to do with that, Andy, is that because of the nature of a flow sensor, what we're trying to do is smooth out the flow, and it's called turbulent flow. That doesn't mean that's waterfall turbulent. That just describes the physics of the flow going through the pipe. But what it means is if, for example, you're going around a a 90-degree elbow, you know, the water goes Uh, It's a longer distance around the outside of the elbow than it is the inside of the elbow. So we've got a difference in the speed that the fluid is moving around the outside. Same thing in a racetrack or anything else. That's why on a you know a high school running track, if you're running the 440 or, or longer races, you'll notice that they switch lanes from the outside to the inside to balance out the distance. Because the guy Mm -hmm. that's always on the outside of the track is going to run a whole lot longer to the finish line than the guy that's on the inside. I see. So your water molecules are not evenly flowing at that point coming around that elbow. No, the velocity is higher on the outside. And so to create, you know, more uniform flow and better measurements, we try and tell people to put straight pipe upstream and downstream of the sensor. 
And then the other thing that you'd want to have, not only a change in direction or a change in size of the pipe, but if you have other devices like master valves, zone valves, or even a gate valve or a ball valve in line, you want to make sure they're not right on top of the flow sensor either for the same reason. You just just disturb the flow pattern of the water going through the sensor and you make it less accurate. Okay, makes sense. And that pretty much follows for most devices. Some mag meters, you know, don't have to have that kind of a thing. And one of the things we designed into our ELF sensor is, and this is what we actually got the patent on it for. We didn't get the patent on it because it's an impeller meter, but we got a patent on the unique shape of it. And the shape that we made into the mounting tee, if you will, also conditions the flow so that we can eliminate the straight pipe upstream and downstream. Mm. Yeah, sometimes adding a flow meter into these systems, you don't have always that much room, especially if it's going indoors. Sometimes you just don't have the distance of straight pipe available. Right. So that was another one of our design goals was to be able to eliminate that straight pipe. And so we did it to the point where we don't have to have it upstream or downstream. And in fact, we can screw a uh, master valve right on the downstream side of the L sensor and have a flow sensor master valve combination that'll fit in a 12 inch valve box. Awesome. That's great detailed information. If we went any more detail, we'd probably lose people. So that's (laughs) that's good information. (laughs) What are you seeing as far as installation in terms of maybe tips that you would have for an installing contractor or things they should keep in mind when they're installing a flow sensor? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I just did a talk not very long ago at a small trade show here in the Northeast, and it was all on kind of those kinds of tips. And basically, you know, what I said is to the contractors is, A, when you go out to put in a flow sensor or to troubleshoot it, make sure that you have the installation guides. Make sure that you read the material on where to locate it. And if it is the kind of sensor that needs straight pipe upstream and downstream, adhere to that. Use the right kind of wire to connect flow sensors. It's not a lighting circuit. It's not a wire to a solenoid on a zone valve. It's a data communications cable. And so you want to make sure it's protected from outside noise or interference from other electrical wiring that's in the ground, maybe in the same trench or crossing the same trench with it. You know, my talk was really on being prepared. Have the right tools with you. You know, being able to put them in right, it's all usually spelled out in not only our installation guides, but everybody's installation guides. But you got to read the guide to make sure you understand how to do it. You know, the other thing is with the wiring, that one of the things that we find the most problematic is splices. You know, and flow sensors are probably even more affected by poor splices than solenoid valves are because they're data communication. They're not just electrical power to open a solenoid or turn on a light. Mm -hmm. They're actually transmitting data, and it's also a DC voltage. Okay, interesting. That's a good point. You know, so it's more critical. So we always try and stress using a gel filled or a silicone grease filled. We're great fans of 3M and not to put in a plug for them, but doing it right. Most people that I talk to about things like this, you know, if you were doing internet cabling and and now that we've gone to Wi-Fi, it isn't as critical, but I can remember putting in computer networks in buildings or schools or industrial manufacturing plants, and the guys that installed all that cabling would say the most critical thing is is all the connections. It's how you make all of the splices and how you join all of the devices together. You know, if you're going to have a problem, it's always with the connections that you've made. Right. Yeah. And I tend to use that example too. I use the phone line, the old fashioned phone line example, because if you cut your phone line that went to your house either 10 years ago or as a kid and you put 10 splices on it, you would know right away if those splices are shitty or not because you're going to hear static on the other end of that line or interference. And if we treated our irrigation cabling like we do, a phone line, or at least the ones that transmit data, like your flow sensor, it's not too far off from that. We're transmitting data on a cable, not just power and voltage. Right. And then the other things we try and make sure people understand is, you know, you have to have access to these things. So I think gone are the days when I first started in the irrigation business. I can remember going to golf courses and they buried the zone valves without a valve box over them. 
And so if you had a problem, you spent half the day with a screwdriver probing around till you found the valve so you can work on it. But, you know, we have people that, that will put a flow sensor or a flow sensor in a master valve and they'll put a, a little round valve box over it. And you say, well, OK, at least that locates it for you. But if you have to take anything out of there, if you have to change a solenoid or change an insert or clean something out, you're going to have to probably remove the box and dig up a hole and cut sod and everything else and creating a lot more work for yourself than if you would put in a you know a 12 inch rectangular box right yeah be thinking about the future think about the future and think about again you know up here in our part of the country we have to winterize irrigation systems so you blow air into them to drive the water out so that you don't have everything crack and break all the pipe over the winter and mm -hmm. You know, some people don't take that into account when they put in flow sensors. And again, plug for my stuff, impeller type sensors are not particularly susceptible to over speed by running air through them. That's a difference between using a, a flow sensor, an impeller type sensor over a water meter. If you try okay. and run air through a, a water meter, you can overspin it and, and heat up the bearings and ruin the thing. Then you get a real job on your hand because in that case, you got to take it completely out of the ground to repair it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is actually a good point. What's the recommendation for winterizing through your sensors or your previous data industrial sensors? They would be the both, you know, for the same thing. And again, I'm drawing on experience of, you know, living and making these things in New England. You know, now it's getting to be over the last 45 years, and we have put thousands and thousands and thousands of flow sensors in the ground. And if it's an impeller type sensor, and unless you're injecting the air right immediately in front of it, uh, you know, we tell people to leave it alone. Just leave it in the ground. Okay. You can run air through them. You don't have to take it out of the T. We have people that want to do that. And we have people that say, well, we like to take them out of the T because it also gives us a chance to make sure that the bearing hasn't worn out, make sure that there isn't anything clogging the system. We use a lot of non-potable water for irrigation and it can have silt and sediment. It can have organic matter in it. It can have leaves, aquatic mm -hmm. weeds, anything else. So they say, hey, if we pull the flow sensor insert out of the T once a year, it gives us a chance to look at it. And if that's the case, we tell people to pull the insert out of the T. We sell a plug that can go back into the T and you can just leave the flow sensor insert laying in the valve box. I wouldn't even okay. recommend uh, disconnecting it from the wires. Don't open up the splice, leave it spliced to the wires and just lay it in the box beside the mounting tee. Okay. So if somebody picks up a new system that has a flow sensor on it or maintains one that they installed and they go to winterize it and they don't have your winterization cap, you're saying it's okay for them to blow air through the device as long as they're not hooking the compressor up just before it. And I want to just ask you, with that being said, we could have a whole discussion about how to winterize your system. And some people believe in high volume, low pressure, and other people just believe in cranking that compressor up to 80 or 100 PSI. Is there any recommendation that you would have for blowing air through your sensors? You know, again, when I was contracting, we were blowing out little three-zone residential systems with nothing larger than one-inch pipe. And I was blowing out golf courses that had eight inch main lines. So to me, the volume has to match the size of the job. And I would rather push water out with more volume and less pressure than vice versa. You can do it either way, but to me, if you can move a larger quantity of air through the pipe, you're going to do a better job of cleaning out the whole pipe and pushing it out through the sprinklers than you are with a high pressure, small volume stream of air. Okay. But either way, it's not necessarily a concern of yours for winterization as long as they're not hooking the compressor up directly before the flow sensor. Right. Our flow sensors basically are rated at 240 PSI working pressure. So, you know, you're not going to run anywhere near close enough to, to hurt them. But of course, I mean, the thing I tell anybody is air is compressible and it's a lot more dangerous than water. So if you're, you know, when you're blowing anything out, you got to be careful that your connections are tight because you certainly don't want to have a coupling valve end up in your face because you, you right. thought the, the system was not pressurized when you pulled the coupling out of the ground. But 
Right. No, either either way will work. And, you know, our flow sensor, again, ours and, and again, data industrial, I'm not saying ours are any different than theirs, but with a high clearance, smooth polyethylene bearing that both of us use, you can't hurt it by running it dry with air. You could spin it with air all day long and it wouldn't hurt it at all. That's very different than a water meter that has a different type of bearing to it that depends on water for lubrication. This is really good information because this is not talked about and I think there's a lot of hearsay. So I appreciate you sharing this. Yeah. Again, looking at it, you know, look at the difference between trying to take a water meter out of the ground compared to just taking the insert out of the top of a impeller type sensor. Well, good. Are there any other thoughts or considerations you'd have for contractors that are installing or maintaining flow sensor devices? I'd say, you know, I'm a great believer in saying read the instructions. And if you have questions, nowadays you can go online and look at FAQ kinds of documents, or you can always shoot somebody an email or call them on the phone. Just ask before you do something. It's mostly common sense, but it's also practical advice, but it's a little different than any other. They're not sprinkler heads. They're not zone valves. They're flow sensors. So sometimes the technical expertise of some crews aren't as great as others. But usually the guys that are putting in smart controllers and putting in maybe moisture sensors or ET controllers or certainly and and weather stations and, you know, rain sensors, all of that is the kind of thing that has to be done, you know, by qualified technicians. Mm -hmm. With a little bit more care, just done with a little more, more care. Yeah, exactly. And if Norm, if somebody wants to learn more about CST or reach out to you directly, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, the easiest thing is I'd say go to our website first. It's, you know, creativesensortechnology.com. Our phone number's there, and there's two emails there that they could use. One of them is sales at creativesensortechnology.com, and the other one is info at creativesensortechnology.com. And we don't mind talking to people. Several of us spend quite a bit of time on the phone just answering questions or trying to walk people through installations and you know, and sometimes the flow sensors, Andy, are the easiest part to troubleshoot or to install in some of our other transmitter and, uh, you know, our other devices that we make to help get the flow sensor information back to a controller that are a little more complicated. Yeah. We'd much rather help somebody by answering some questions up front or while they're putting it in rather than get the questions from somebody who's upset because they put it in and it didn't work. Right, right. Good. Well, we've covered a lot of stuff and there's even more we could cover maybe at another time. So Norm, I appreciate you spending the time with us today. Thanks so much. Well, you're welcome and, and thanks for having me and uh, I'd be glad to do it in the future if that's the case. Okay. Awesome. Well, have a great day, Norm. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. Talk to you later. So I knew Norm had a lot to say. Thanks for your patience today, everyone. We talked about a lot of interesting flow sensing tips, tricks, and technology. And a couple things that stand out to me that I wanted to sort of close with were the importance of using the right wire and the importance of connections. I do appreciate that Norm spoke to this, and I do see this on the commercial two-wire side of the business, that at the end of the day, connections mean everything. So if you have the opportunity to work with your staff to understand the correct way to do splices and the correct types of splices to use, it can go a long way to make sure that these new float sensing devices, moisture sensing devices, decoders, and such communicate properly and work 100% of the time. So again, if you want to reach out to me, my email is andy at sprinklernerd.com. I would love to hear from you. I would love to know what type of business you're in, where you live. And if you have any thoughts or feedback on this show, please reach out any time. So I think that will definitely wrap up this show, guys. We're getting almost to an hour. And so until the next episode, happy sprinkling, and we'll talk to you then.